Hello, my name is Angela Hayes. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni and Online Career Engagement. And today we'll be talking about making small changes that lead to big gains in a fairly short period of time. I chose this topic because from the beginning of the pandemic, people have been telling me that they feel like they should be able to get a lot more done than what they're getting done because they're home. Um, during lockdown, they thought they should be able to knock out a new exercise routine that would stick and that they would eat healthy and that they would cure their insomnia and all kinds of big plans that they had. But the thing is that doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Actually, we'll talk about later for a really small percentage of the population it does, but for the most part, it doesn't. So we're gonna talk about what does work. Um, I'll also be sending this PowerPoint to those of you who attended today because there's a lot of instructions on the slides that will, um, will get you started and actually take you through the whole process of creating habits in a way that does work. So we're gonna be covering these three main things. The Tiny Habits Method, and this mostly comes from a book called Tiny Habits, The Small Changes That Change Everything by BJ Fogg. He's a researcher at Stanford. He also teaches several classes on this method and he travels the world consulting with organizations using this method. Um, we're also gonna talk about how to create tiny habits that work and then we'll finish with how to maintain and build on your progress. If you've tried and failed to make changes in your behavior in the past, I'm here to tell you it is not your fault. It's that the change wasn't designed properly. So we'll talk about foolproof ways to design the changes you wanna make. We're also gonna get rid of the idea that education is the key. Most behavior changes change models are built on the belief that if you give people enough information about why the change is important and why they should change, then they'll change easily and immediately. Raise your hand if you think that's how things work. Is that how things have worked for you? Or you can put it in the chat, whichever. Okay. So it would be great if it worked that way for everybody. It works that way for about 11% of the population where if you just give them education and tell them why they need to, to make these changes, then they can have the proper motivation and it works. For the rest of us, that's not how it works. Um, so the reason it often doesn't is because that idea relies on motivation being enough to create sustained behavior change. This leads to self-judgment if we fail. We tend to think we must be weak or we lack self-discipline because this other person was able to do it. You know, they were given the same education you were and they were told why they needed to change and they were able to do it. And often we feel so bad about it that we don't try again. Instead, we need to realize that we have to redesign the new habit and try again. And if that doesn't work, redesign and try again. It's important to know, and I can't stress this enough, it's the design that needs to be tweaked. It's not your level of motivation that needs to be tweaked. It's the design itself of how you're making that change. And we're gonna come back to that several times because that's a point I want you to remember. It's not about your motivation. That's only one piece and it's the least reliable piece. And so that's, it's the one that we wanna rely on the least when we make these behavior changes or work toward designing these behavior changes. That's one of the reasons why when we design these behavior changes, we wanna start out so tiny that motivation doesn't even really enter in because it's so small that you can have the motivation to do it because it's such a tiny thing. Let's, let's talk about that a bit more. So when you create these tiny habits to start, and believe me, they will grow from there, but we start out tiny and usually they take 30 seconds or less. Some of them take five seconds or less. They're really easy to do. 
And we're going to be using personal behaviors and routines that you already do to anchor in these new positive habits. The key is that the new habits need to be really small. I know I'm overemphasizing, but that's important. They need to be really small because you want to get immediate, good, reinforcing feedback for doing that small habit. Again, I promise you it will grow exponentially from there if you keep it really small in the beginning and if it's been designed correctly. If it's not working, we just need to figure out why and we try again with something else. Research shows that people have the most routines in the morning that they can attach new behaviors to because as the day goes on, one thing after another comes up and things get off track. But in the morning, you often have anchor moments anchor routines that you can attach these new tiny behaviors to the most reliably. So if you shrink it enough, you can do it no matter where your motivation is. And later we'll talk about the other two things that are important besides motivation. So there are two ways to make a behavior really tiny. You can do a starter step, like let's say you want to walk 30 minutes per day a starter step is putting on your walking shoes every day for the first week, and that's it. That's the entire new habit. If you want to cook yourself a hot breakfast, a starter step would be turning on the stove burner and then turning it back off in the morning, and that's it for the first week. I know it sounds ridiculous, but we'll talk about why that works as we move through the presentation. So a starter step or scaling back is the other way that you can do this. So for example, if you wanna walk for scaling back, if you wanna walk 30 minutes a day, you can put on your walking shoes and walk to the front gate or the mailbox and then come back in, that's scaling back. If you wanna cook a hot, healthy breakfast in the morning, scaling back would be um, two minute microwave oatmeal and that's it for like the first week. That's not your end result because you want a much healthier breakfast than that because it has a lot of add additives and that sort of thing. But that's your starter step for at least a week, your scaled back step. The most important thing is to keep the tiny habit alive. So let's say on a particular day, you walk past the gate in that first week, let's say, or in the second week you work you walk past the gate and you walk 20 minutes and come back. If on the next day you're not up to that 20 minutes, you walk to the gate and come back. The important thing is consistency to keep the habit alive. Not how much you do on a given day because that will build as we continue to build out the habit. When you do build them, if we're doing this right, it should feel fun and uh, good and like you're accomplishing something, not like a chore. The low baseline is always the baseline. So walking to the gate, coming back, that's the baseline. Anything more is optional until you decide that you're going to add more to that tiny habit. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. So to start, and I'm not asking you to do this right now, but when you're doing this process, you'll want to list all the daily habits you do in the morning, before you get to work, daily habits before lunch and so on. And you'll be using this list to anchor in the new habits. This process works the very best if you attach the new habits to something you're already doing. And it's especially helpful if they have the same theme, like flossing one tooth. Yes, you heard me right, one tooth for that beginning starter step for maybe a week when you're brushing your teeth instead of like when you're watching TV or something like that. It helps if it's the same theme and in the same place. The prompt will remind you to do the action. You're already brushing your teeth. It reminds you that you also need to floss one tooth. And they need to be specific events. So if it's fuzzy, like after dinner or whenever I feel stressed, it doesn't use them well as an anchor behavior. You could think of them as anchor moments, like a specific moment in time, which implies a precise moment. Then you create a list of the new habits you wanna start. So let's say you wanna start 
exercising regularly, eat healthy, start meditating, floss regularly, get better sleep, start pairing the new habits with the best anchor for that particular habit that you want to start. And take three things into account. The physical location. Consider the physical location of the new habit and pick an anchor that you already do in that location. So if you want the habit to be wiping down countertops in the kitchen, have the anchor be something that you're already doing in the kitchen. If you need to switch locations, you're much less likely to carry out the behavior. So you won't want it to be something like, after I load the dishwasher, I will clean out my car. Being this in the same physical location greatly increases the chances that you're gonna do it because you're already there, the anchor happens, it's easy to do. Also match the frequency. Look at your existing routine and decide how often you wanna do the new habit. If you wanna do it once a day, pick an anchor that you do once a day. If you wanna do it four times a day, pick an anchor that you, wanted, that you already do four times a day. And then match the theme and purpose. So an example from one client is, after I water my jade plant in the morning, I will drink a full glass of water so that I will nurture both the plant and myself. Or after I brush my teeth, I will floss one tooth to move me closer to my um, goal of having excellent dental hygiene, something like that. If you say, after I brush my teeth, I will sweep the garage, it's not likely to happen. It doesn't match location, frequency, or theme. And if it's not working, just change it. Experiment until you find what works. What anchor works for the new behavior that you want to start? So let's look at an example. And this is how to start really small. And also, I'll tell you about how this um, eventually got much bigger. So Melissa's business had been flailing and she felt completely overwhelmed with everything she had to do to get it back on track. There were so many things she had to do to get it back on track. So she decided to try the tiny habits approach because she didn't even know where to start. So each morning when she dropped off her daughter, when the door closed, so that was her anchor, when the door closed after her daughter got out of the car to go to school, that was the start of her work day when that door closed. And so she would immediately pull into an open parking space and she had post-it notes in her car and she would write the one most important thing she needed to accomplish that day, just one on a sticky note. And then she would drive home, she worked from home. So she would drive home and she would take that sticky note and put it on the wall next to her desk where she would see it. <clears throat> Most of the time she just went ahead and did whatever it was that one thing was, but sometimes she didn't. And that was the important piece to keep the habit alive, to always write that down on the sticky note and then have it up on the wall. And eventually she could see the variety of things that needed to be done to get her business back on track. This is a real person. And within a fairly short period of time, she had did each of those things day after day she was just a one person shop. Now she's hired 20 people to keep up with all the demand for her products and services with the companies that she serves. So when you've got your list of daily routines and you've decided on some daily routine anchors, then you build your list of new habits that you wanna create. And that list can be general, like exercise more, get better sleep, lost my teeth every day, start daily meditation, eat healthy food, but now you're going to make it really tiny to start. A little bit later, we'll get back to why that's so important. So to start, it's good to pick three anchors that you can rely on and pick three small habits that can go with them. You can use this format, try it out and then revise it as needed to come up with just the right recipe. Let me point out that the third step, the celebration piece is very important in anchoring in new habits quickly. It can be a fist bump or pump, I guess we're not really fist bumping other people right now, 
uh, but it can be like a fist pump. It can be a fist bump with yourself with the explosion thing um, where you say, yeah, um, that's my personal favorite. You can also sing the theme from Rocky either out loud or in your head. Um, and maybe jump around with your arms over your head like Rocky did at the top of the stairs. Use what works for you. But know that the celebration is a big part of what wires the brain to want you to repeat that new habit. It can be something that you do internally or externally that makes you feel good and creates a feeling of success. The author of the book that I mentioned, BJ Fogg, he calls this feeling shine. The celebration piece is so important because when you experience positive reinforcement, your brain produces dopamine, which controls the brain's reward center and reminds us and helps us remember what behavior led to that good feeling and reinforces the likelihood that we'll do it again. Some of these will be pretty easy and obvious like flossing one tooth each time you brush your teeth and others will take a bit and you need to experiment and shift things around to make them stick. If one habit doesn't hook naturally to an anchor, you might be inspired to replace it with a different habit that seems like a better fit. Also, you might need to look at the anchor more closely to see what the last action is. Instead of after I get home from work, remember we want it to be anchor moments, very specific moments in time. So instead of after I get home from work, it would be after I put my keys on the hook or after I place my purse on the bench. You'll wanna be that specific. Also, if you wanna wire the habit in fast, rehearse the behavior sequence, the anchor and the new habit seven to 10 times in a row and celebrate each time. If you wanna anchor it in even faster, celebrate when you remember the anchor, when you remember to do the habit and then the, that you remember to celebrate if you do that over and over again, I know it sounds silly, but it anchors in that habit so much more quickly and then you're off and running with whatever new behaviors you want to anchor in. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that you don't need to keep the celebration going once the habit has been anchored in. So. A habit in its truest form is something you do without thinking. So once you get to the point where whenever you do, whenever the anchor behavior happens, you just automatically do the habit without thinking about it. That means it's wired in and you don't need to do the celebration. Unless let's say you've been sick for a while and haven't done the habit for a while, or you've been on vacation or something has happened that, um, has just made things kind of topsy-turvy for a while and you need to settle back down, then you might want to reintroduce this, introduce the celebration until you don't need it anymore. But while you do need it, and I totally get it because I'm the kind of person that I, I said, oh, you know, that's probably not that important. I don't really need to do that. You do. It is that important. That is how you anchor it in much more quickly and greatly increase the chances that you're going to keep doing whatever that behavior is. I also really like um, something that the author calls pearl habits. And pearl habits are like when there's something that annoys you or irritates you, that you use that as the anchor to do some positive thing, some positive habit. So for example, um, <clears throat> There was a woman that he was working with who was going through a divorce and a custody battle. And her ex-husband would often say, uh, just nasty and um, just insulting kinds of things to her whenever they would try to work through, you know, with the lawyer, or with the mediator. And so she decided to use each time he did that to do something nice for herself and take care of herself. So that might be he would say something so she would, at the end of that, she'd go to her favorite coffee shop or take a walk in her favorite park or schedule a massage. And eventually she saw the kinds of things he was saying, these negative things he was saying as um, a gift because it reminded her, it was the anchor moment that reminded her 
to do something good for herself and then celebrate that she had done something good for herself. And in fact, she started to get kind of a smile and a chuckle whenever he would say something like that, which he didn't understand, which made it even more fun. So you can use those prompts. For me, it's a, um, I've got a neighbor who has a diesel and for some reason he has to idle it for 30 minutes before he leaves. And then he idles it for 20 to 30 minutes when he comes back and he's just right in front of my um, window. So I use it as the same kind of thing to either do relaxation or put on music that I really like something so that um, that pearl habit becomes a good thing instead of the annoyance that it was for like the last year before I thought about making that a pearl habit. So I'll say it again. The celebration piece is vitally important for the habit to stick and grow. Don't blow it off. It's easy to do, but in the beginning, don't blow it off. Later, you can forget about it, but not in the beginning. It's how you hardwire the habit into the brain. So for example, Jim's starter step, remember we talked about starter steps and scale back. Jim's starter step for doing yoga in the morning was to unroll his yoga mat in the living room. That was it. For the first two weeks, all he did was unroll his yoga mat in his living room. And then he would dance back and forth on the yoga mat, singing the Rocky song and, and you know putting his hands over his head. His mailman saw him through the window. Uh, he looked a little concerned. So Jim decided it was best that that celebration be done with the blinds drawn. So um, we'll keep that in mind. There's celebrations that you'll do in private, celebrations that um, you can do in public. So it's so important to add these that I've given you examples here. We won't go through all of them, but you'll have these slides and you can look through them. Do what works for you. And if you still have trouble celebrating something so tiny, remember all the times you wanted to make a change in your life and you didn't. Even a tiny step forward means you're making that change now and that it will grow. And that's something to celebrate. So let's talk more about why we want to start tiny. In creating new habits, motivation can be your friend or not, depending on how much motivation or lack of motivation we feel at any given time. At this point in my life, I've probably heard thousands of people tell me that this is it. They've decided they're going to do it. They're going to lose those 40 pounds. They're going to run a marathon in four months, even though they've never run a block before. They're going to throw out all the unhealthy food from, from their refrigerator, from their from every, every part of their kitchen and every place they have unhealthy food stashed. It's gone. They're going to start eating healthy today. They go to the grocery store, they bring home all kinds of healthy food, and they will do this for the rest of their lives. I've delivered plenty of those proclamations myself. Um, show of hands, how many of you have said something like that and meant it at the time? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, me too. Because at the time, you feel all this motivation, right? At that time, you feel the motivation to do it and you know you're going to, I mean, that motivation feels good, that high level of motivation. And as I mentioned before, occasionally that works. Right around 11% of the population can pull something like that off. Not all the time, but right around 11% can. They do have the ability to pull that off. So why doesn't it work for most of us? This is one of my favorite truths about those kinds of proclamations. Why doesn't it work to make these big changes? Why do we feel so sure at the time that it's going to work, that we're going to do it? And then we don't. What are we missing? In the chat box, if you would tell me why these things often don't work. Why don't big, bold changes usually work? What do you think? Too overwhelming, yeah. It's a huge amount of thing. Too much, unrealistic, yes, absolutely. 
even though in that moment we feel like we're going to be able to do it. In fact, we're sure we're going to be able to do it. But yes, that high level of motivation does not stick around because what we're doing is hard and time consuming and life gets busy and one thing leads to another and then we're no longer working toward what we were so sure we were going to do. We told everybody we were going to do it. And there's a lot of talk out there about motivation and willpower as the things that we need to make and sustain change. I'm here to tell you that is not it. That's only one piece and you can't rely on it because it changes quickly and motivation is an unreliable partner in making the changes you wanna make. It's like the friend who's the life of the party, who's great at parties, it's really fun to be around but would you trust them to drive you to the airport the next morning or pick you up from the airport? No, because you can't rely on it. There might be all kinds of energy here, but maybe not so much energy in other kinds of areas. So this formula, behavior equals motivation, ability, and prompt, this formula applies to any human behavior from cleaning off the counters to climbing Mount Everest. Behavior equals motivation, ability, and a prompt. And as we mentioned, motivation fluctuates wildly from day to day and behavior to behavior. It's the most difficult way into a new habit. Think about it like three different ways to enter a building. Prompt is like driving up to the parking lot and seeing the front door. Ability is like opening the front door and walking in. Motivation is like rappelling down a rope attached to a helicopter, landing on the roof, picking the lock of the rooftop door, and then walking in. It's almost never the easiest way to change a behavior. Always best to focus on ability and prompt first and only focus on motivation as a last resort. Now, ability can mean your own skills related to the behavior or the difficulty of the behavior itself. In terms of behavior change, you start by making the behavior as easy to do as possible. And then prompts. While motivation and ability can vary, prompts are one or the other. You either notice the prompt or you don't notice the prompt. So behave, for behavior to happen, motivation, ability, and a prompt need to all be there. If one is missing, the behavior won't happen. And this is the key to why starting tiny works so well. If you look at this behavior model, you'll see that, again, these three things that are most important and need to happen at the same time for the new behavior to occur and for it to turn into a habit, motivation, ability, and a prompt. When a behavior doesn't happen, at least one of these three elements is missing. So you can see the action line in green. If a behavior is easy to do, the prompt is there and the motivation is high, which it probably will be if it's a really easy thing to do, the behavior will happen. So if it's really small, then you have the ability to do it. If you attach it to something you're already doing and you celebrate it, then you will likely have the motivation to do it well and to build on it. We'll talk about that in a minute. So if you pick the right tiny habits, you'll eventually scale them up, but, but let's not uh, get ahead of ourselves. So when something doesn't work, you can stop blaming it on things like character or self-discipline or lack of motivation because that isn't it. It's only one piece and it's the least reliable piece, almost not worth even talking about. All things being equal, if you're highly motivated to do a behavior, you're more likely to do it, of course. If a behavior is easy, you're more likely to do it. And if you're prompted to do an easy behavior, you're more likely to do it. And that's for good and bad habits. So for good habits, you tie them to prompts and make them easier. For bad habits, you try to take away the prompts and or make them harder to do. We'll talk about that in just a bit. You might also change the tool to make the habit easier. For example, when I was trying to remember to floss every night, 
I had the floss sitting right by my toothbrush and I usually couldn't still get myself to do it. I hated the whole process of tearing off the floss and wrapping around my fingers and getting in weird positions and my teeth are really close together. So almost every time the floss would break and then I'd have to do the whole thing over again and try to get the floss out, the first floss out in order to finish flossing. So I just didn't do it. And then I thought about how can I make this easier? This is after I read this book and other um, related kinds of books. And I remember that there were those little like U-shaped things that with a handle that has a piece of floss across, I think they're called flossers. And those looked easier to deal with. And so I put a little container of those next to my toothbrush and I floss my teeth every day. I have every day now for, um, eight months. And that's after decades of having conversations with my dentist about why I wasn't flossing and how important it was, it was to floss. And I would proclaim to him that I would begin flossing that very day and would for the rest of my life. I made it easier. I had the prompt. So I had the motivation to do it. So these are the questions you can ask yourself to work on making a behavior, the habit you want to create, easier to do. Making the behavior easy to do makes it take root and grow, and it also keeps your momentum going even when things are tough. There'll be days when your motivation drops, and when it does, go back to doing the tiniest of the habit that you created. Even if you've ramped up, just go back to doing the tiniest, tiniest of that habit. That'll keep the habit going, and it allows you to keep from feeling bad because you're still doing the habit. So you might be flossing one tooth again for a few days or for a week, but the habit's still going. When it comes to scaling up, there are two general categories, habits that grow and habits that multiply. The essence of the habits is the same, but you do more of them. The habits expand or is that success in one area of habits multiplies into related areas. A big part of this is that success breeds success and it's the frequency of your successes, not the size of them that makes the most difference. So you're shooting for a bunch of tiny habit successes rather than a big one that takes a long time if you wanna progress more quickly. It's also important to note that the first time someone tries a new behavior is a critical moment in terms of habit formation. If you do something big and things don't go well from your perspective and you feel like a failure, you're much less likely to repeat that behavior in the future. Craft your behaviors by selecting and adjusting the habits you want in your life. Do what interests you. Some people work, like to work on lots of little easy habits. Others like to tackle things that are a bit more challenging, but again, don't go too far with that, not in the beginning. Even if you go bigger, break them down first into really small habits that you can succeed in right away and then build from there. Most people who use this process pick three small habits and do those for a month, and then they pick three more the following month and so on. I've been using this time at home to tackle more small habits because it's easier to anchor things into different rooms in my house than it would be if I was in an office setting. So you might also use a variety of habits to learn quickly what works best for you. You might have an exercise habit, a food related habit, a productivity habit, and be flexible as you progress. Also keep in mind, Things that seemed important a couple of months ago might not be at all now, and that's fine. If you let go of some of those habits that don't mean anything to you anymore, that, that gives you the time and the energy to create new habits that do mean something to you. You're very unlikely to fail when you start small and those habits will build over time. Feeling successful leads to more new behaviors with more successes and so on. When you succeed, your overall motivation goes up and you try harder behaviors. That's just how it works. So this is how you build on success that keeps you moving forward. 
what most of us do, and again, I know I've said this over and over, but it's important to remember what most of us do is, oh, you know, I don't need all of that. I'm just going to make the changes I want to make. So they do something drastic. So we decide that tomorrow is the day we'll begin eating healthy and exercising. Throw out all the junk food, buy healthy groceries. We see someone biking to work and we decide that's what I'm going to do from now on. And you buy a new helmet and a rear view mirror and the next day it's pouring rain and it rains all week. And by the following week, eh, you know, it doesn't seem uh, like you really want to bike 10 miles to work every day one way. Um, but you did a week ago. It's just that, that you don't now. And that isn't because there's anything wrong with any of us. It's because the system of change is flawed. We're not built to completely change everything and then bounce back from all the failures along the way. People make changes when they feel good, when they feel successful. Starting small is what helps you maintain that success and that feeling of victory. So let's look at this example of David. He wanted to make a healthy breakfast. That's, that's what his... Um, that's the initial habit he wanted to make a healthy breakfast. So there were a variety of reasons why that wasn't happening. He was running late because he was scrolling through his, um, his social media in the morning because that was his alarm. So he got an old school alarm clock. He let his phone charge in the kitchen. He used a starter step by turning on the stove burner and turning it off. And that's all for the first week. After about a week, he put a pot of water on the burner and let it boil and then turned it off. And after another week, he got out oatmeal and put that in. Then he picked up some blueberries one day while he was out for his oatmeal. And then while the oatmeal was cooking, he decided to make a healthy lunch because, I mean, he had time. What was he going to do while it was uh, while it was cooking? After a month, he was making three meals again. He's a real person. He was making three meals, healthy ones, at home, and he had begun running a mile three times per week. So in the chat box, and so everybody can see it, you can put it to all panelists um, and participants if you want, or attendees, I think is what it says. Tell me, what do you think would have happened? So this is how it worked for David. What do you think would have happened if instead he would have said, tomorrow, starting tomorrow, I'm going to make three healthy meals a day, and I'm going to start... Um, I'm going to start exercising at least three times a week, and I'm not going to scroll through my social media in the morning. Starting tomorrow, what do you think would have happened? Yeah, big failure, too much at once. Yeah, he'd have changed his mind. Something would have happened. He would have gotten sick or maybe a relative was visiting or something would have happened that threw him off track. Absolutely. So let's talk about getting rid of bad habits a little bit. Remember that if you remove motivation, ability, and prompt, you can stop a specific habit. Research shows that starting with the prompt is your best bet. So remove the prompt. Avoid the prompt or ignore the prompt. As I go through this, I acknowledge that some of these are harder to do when they involve other people, but we won't be getting into that today because of the short time frame that we have. I am happy to talk to people one-on-one -on -one if you want to contact me after. Um, but let's say you want to stop looking at social media once you sit down to work. So you could turn off your phone you could put it on airplane mode. You could turn off notifications from social media. So the tiny ha habit recipe would be, after I sit down to work, I will turn off the notifications from my social media app, and then I will celebrate by doing whatever you do. You could remove the social media app completely from the phone if you feel like it's taking too much of your time. And that would be a one-time action that removes the prompt, but it's too drastic for many people. You can also avoid the prompt. So if, for example, you want to stop getting those really wonderful chocolate croissants at the coffee shop where you stop that are just staring at you as you're doing your coffee order, they're just right there at eye level. If you want to 
remove that prompt, make your coffee at home and don't go to that coffee shop until you've created a habit. I mean, maybe later on you'd be able to have it staring at you and you'd be fine. But for now, just remove the prompt. Don't go in there, make the coffee at home or make your breakfast at home. You can also, um, You could re redesign your ability in order to stop a habit. In other words, make a habit harder to do. So for example, if you like to eat ice cream every night while you're watching TV, you could make that harder to do. So the prompt of sitting down at the TV, that's the prompt, but your ability, you could make that harder to do by never having ice cream in the house. So if you want ice cream, you'd have to Put on your coat, put on your shoes, get your keys, um, drive to the store, get the ice cream, bring it back, put it in a bowl, sit down. You can make it harder to do. Um, the author of that book that I mentioned did a really interesting thing to try to stop watching. Well, he had stopped watching TV while he was doing his master's but his sister moved in with him and she brought a TV along, which he wasn't happy about. So he, um, he got an engineering student to wire it to uh, an exercise bike. And the only way that the TV would come on is if the pedals were moving. So not only did they watch a lot less TV, but they got in, in good shape. You can also, if you think you're watching too much TV, you can put the TV away or you can and hook everything so you'd have to hook everything back up or if you're scrolling through social media too much keep in mind that you can make the activity harder because we're we've um we've evolved to conserve energy so if you change the password to something really long and it has symbols and letters and it doesn't make any sense and it takes a really long time to put it in and you don't put it so that it automatically saves it, you have to put all of that in to get into that social media. You're much less likely to do it. You're not going to do it as often. Um, so those are some ideas. Increasing the mental effort required or increasing the physical effort required. So if you want to be the type of person that's loving and appreciative, you might practice saying a heartfelt thank you to your husband and kids after they've done something nice for you. Putting on your running shoes every morning is a small thing, but it fits with your aspiration of running a 5K in the spring. If you have an aspiration of being someone who cares about the environment, you can start carrying your own bottle of drinking water instead of using new plastic bottles from the store or vending machine every day. David turning on the stove was small, but it led to a huge number of positive changes. He wanted to be a person who ate healthy and took care of himself. When you ask yourself what tiny habits will have the most meaning and write down the list, you can, you're practicing the skill of moving toward transformation. Pay special attention to those things on your list that you want to do, as opposed to what you think you should do or what your mother thinks you should do or what worked for a friend. This is about you and your journey toward being the person you wanna be. This also helps you let go of new tiny habits that don't really have meaning for you. It's often helpful to look at the deeper meaning behind a habit to see if it is or isn't important enough to continue. Wiping down the kitchen counters just before bed may not seem like a big thing, but if you think about the fact that your partner is gonna be making breakfast for the family in the morning and he highly values working in a clean kitchen and really hates when it isn't and it immediately puts him in a foul mood, then the meaning behind it is having a more loving and harmonious family life. Or maybe adding exercise into your routine doesn't seem that important until you think about the fact that you wanna be fit and healthy to be able to get down on the floor to play with your grandkids and be able to easily get back up again when they're little and be fit and healthy enough to be around to see them grow up. So as you look closely at your tiny habits, you might find that some have deeper meaning and you might find that some of them don't. So if they do, great, you can keep working on them and keep scaling up. 
And if not, also great. That frees up time for habits that actually matter to you. As you reach for more with your tiny habits, take care to decide how much more will still be comfortable. And when, or when doing more will lead to a sense of pain or frustration, which will weaken the habit. Sometimes you'll need to realize that you've taken it too far and you back off to the baseline, feeling good that you're keeping the habit alive. If you do reach for what seems like too much, celebrate extra hard to keep the habit strong. Otherwise it can weaken the habit too much and you might drop it entirely. If you're feeling like avoiding the habit altogether, you know that you've pushed too hard too fast. Or if you're starting to become bored with your habit, it's probably time to ramp it up. Know that this is a skill and a process. You'll get better with practice. And when you find what works for you, future changes will be easier, so you'll keep going. As changing habits gets easier, you become more efficient, have more time to do the things you really love. Mastering these new habits will also make you a more joyful and resilient person. As bad habits drop away and are replaced with good habits, you'll find that you're more productive at work, have better relationships, are healthier, and are stepping into the person that you want to be. So if you'd like to contact me individually, you see my contact information here. This could be to answer any questions that you have about the presentation or creating your own habits. I'd be happy to work with you on that. And also I'd be happy to work with you um, on your job search or professional development in any other way. So, what questions do you have? Just uh, whatever questions you have, um, go ahead and put those in the chat. Yes, thank you. Thanks for being here. Does anyone have questions? I saw earlier in the chat, I usually leave the questions for the end, but I saw earlier in the chat that someone mentioned anxiety and what part that could play. If you'd like, could you um, in the chat tell me more specifically what you're thinking about that and we can talk about how, um, how this process could be used in that case. And if not, that's fine too. How much does fear play into habit forming? I would say a lot when we're not in control. Um, when we're not in control of creating the habit and it's, a, it's something external that's happening and we're feeling like we can't have control or don't have control over it, um, then I would say it plays a big part but even starting with tiny habits can, can turn that around. It doesn't seem like it could, but, but it can. And even that feeling of fear could be used as the anchor to do something relaxing or something good or something um, that's gonna help dissipate that fear. Because we know that fear is fight, flight, or freeze. So doing something to dispel that energy um, can help let go of the fear but if you want to talk more about that, um, drop me an email because I, I think there's several layers that we could talk about there. Any other questions? So is everybody ready to go out and create tiny habits? Good. I see one.
Great. All right. Well, again, if you have any further questions, if something comes up, feel free to contact me. Um, also, I would be delighted to work with you on your career, your professional development, um, any kinds of things, any questions that you have or anything I can help you with. Please let me know. And thank you so much for being here today. Bye.